if it's a legitimate tractor. Good morning. Welcome to the worship. We come together on a very beautiful day in uh, this uh, creation that God has given to us. We come together today with much thanks. Uh, there are announcements for you today. There are some on, on the back, but also there's an insert today that uh, we're going to be starting to uh, use. And uh, also just a note there about the things coming up uh, uh, fairly immediately, I guess. So it's uh, next Sunday at uh, Kirkwall Presbyterian. There's their um, uh, fundraiser for the Canada Food Greens Bank. Uh, please keep that in mind. You might head up after church and have a cup of corn and, uh, and give some support to the uh, Canada Food Greens Bank. And then also Field uh, and United Church on September 6th uh, has a Chinese buffet dinner and uh, uh, there is a number there if you would like to get tickets for that to help support them. Other announcements are there for your reading and we have lots of activities coming up for September so uh, uh, as we get out of the summertime and into the fall then we'll have lots more activities that we'll be talking about.
So may your spirit fall on us, God, and renew us, so that we may bring refreshment and joy to others. Let us join together in the opening prayer that is printed in your bulletin. And let us pray together. Lord, we come as we are to become what you meant us to be. We come as we are, broken, afraid, and full of disappointment at times. And we ask you to make us whole and set us free. We come as we are with all our plans and our dreams, our joy and our sorrows, to be touched by your grace and held in your love. We come as we are, God, and we praise you when we pray. Amen. And the response of Psalm is 105, parts 3 and 4, and it's page 829 in the
get bread in the store, we go and buy it. Has anyone ever made bread in your home? Has seen it made? Yeah. Make bread at home? How long does it take to bake bread? How long? 40 minutes? Okay, you go. <laughs> at least that. Because um, I remember once uh, being at university, living in a house with a whole bunch of students. And at 10 o'clock one night, we decided we would make some bread. Well, <laughs> we know it's not just 40 minutes. Okay. So, you have to take the flour and all the different things that go in it, and you knead it, and pound it up, and knead it. Then you have to put it in a big bowl, put the tea towel over, let it sit and rise for a couple of hours, and then you come back to it, and you pound it down. Eh? You like that part? Pound it down. And then you cut it up into the loaves, and then put it into the loaf pans. And you have to let it rise again. And then finally, you get to put it in the oven, and there you go. So it takes, yeah, probably four hours anyway. So uh, I remember that night, we were setting alarms and taking turns about uh, being able to get this bread together. I think I drew the last uh, one, because uh, I was the one that had to take it out of the oven, and I remember touching the back of my hand on the grate or something, and. Uh, uh, there we are, the bread fell on the floor, and I probably said a few nice words, and uh, you know, get a little attention, because after all, I had to get up to do this. Well, it's not just that four hours that it takes to bake bread, because after all, we need to have the wheat, the flour. And so, how long does that take? Well, it's several months. People are out threshing now and combining on the fields. It takes several months to be able to get that grain to make the flour that makes the bread. And after all, probably for that soil that the grain is growing in, it's taken like thousands of years for that soil to be made out of the crust of the earth since it was formed. And so bread takes thousands of years to make a loaf of bread, right? And so that's uh, a recognition about how important it is that bread is in our lives and how long it takes. And that when we have a loaf of bread, remember how long it took for it to be made. And uh, let's join together in a prayer. We can do an echo prayer and all the adults will help us because we don't want to just uh, force this on children. So uh, let's join together in prayer. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes, and concentrate on God. Oh, gracious God, oh, gracious God, I thank you, I thank you for everything from the earth, for everything from the earth and the bread that we eat. Jesus answered them, 
This is what the work of this is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. So they said to him, Then what sign do you do that we may see and believe in you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. My Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. Jesus said to him, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Reading from John chapter 6, verses 24 to 35. <clears throat> there are those times in my life which may have been like yours. You come home in the evening time and you smell bread that has been made. I know nowadays because of all the, the procedure involved, we don't do a lot of bread baking. In fact, they have those machines that do it now too that you can plug in in your home. But there was something really nice about being able to come home in those times when bread was being made. And there'd be three or four loaves, and it would be sliced open really fresh and still warm for supper. And you'd spread butter on it, and it would taste so good. Bread just seems to bring up some really strong feelings for us. Because there's all that work in it, and there is the smell of the bread, and the taste of it when it is made. There's just that old feeling that this says home that everything is right and good. Bread, of course, is a staple for our day. We have it at almost every meal. My wife does lots of cooking. She's glad to have that chance to be able to have a kitchen and a home and be able to cook and make certain things for me to take for lunch. But then by, towards the end of the week, uh, yes, I'm on my own, and I spend a lot of years on my own, and you know, a cheese sandwich is just about all that I really need. I could have that probably three times a day. <laughs> and it's a staple for the church as well. Because it seems often when we have church meetings and gatherings, uh, we have a few sandwiches. And it just is a part of coming together as a community. I know in one of the towns I was in, uh, there was a fellow who only showed up at funerals, whether he knew the person or not. He said, you got to go to a funeral to get a good salmon sandwich. <laughs> well, bread goes back 10,000 years. And it is a significant transition for us within humanity. And therefore, it means so much for us in this day. You see, it used to be that there were hunters and gatherers. You know, people would go out and hunt the food that they needed and gather some berries or whatever was growing in the bush. And that was how the community sustained itself. But then that came that time when people settled down and became farmers. And that was a huge transition for humanity. Because as we moved from the hunters and gatherers to the uh, farmers, people were able to look after a lot more. After all, as you're growing crops, you can increase production, and it meant that people were able, we were able to sustain a lot more people. And at this point, we're sustaining uh, quite a few billion on Earth, and as time goes on, we'll have to sustain like 10 billion people on the food that we produce in this Earth. And so we need to do it efficiently. There's no way that we could uh, do that as gatherers and hunters that really we need agriculture, and the kind of intensive agriculture that we have today. And so more people were able to be sustained on less land. And there was more consistent production of food as well. People knew that they would be able to eat when they wanted to eat, that they weren't dependent on whether the um, land had provided that which was needed uh, as they were hunting. 
And so this production and consistency allowed for settlement. And therefore, for all the culture and all the industry that we have in our day. And so in the early days, they had mostly unleavened bread from whatever grains were around to use. But if it's left long enough, there's enough natural yeast that it will eventually rise. But given time, people found out that they could produce some yeast that would allow bread to rise. And uh, it was usually in the beginning the sourdough that some of us use in this day. You save a little bit for the next day for the production of bread the next day. In the Middle Ages, bread even became the tableware. It was brought back briefly, I think, by Tim Hortons a few years ago. Remember, you could get your chili in a bread bowl or soup or whatever in a bread bowl, and so you could eat the bowl, was the story in the ads. But that's the way it used to be, that they used the bread to actually hold the food. And you could sop up all the gravy and all of that with the bread that was given to you. And so bread really enabled the kind of civilization that we have. For the Egyptians, it was the basis of their administration system because they were able to trade bread. For the Jews, it was their religious beginnings. And you remember the stories about how at the Passover they had to make sure that uh, they got out quickly so the bread didn't have time to rise, so they had unleavened bread. And for the Greek, it is very much a part of their legends that they have within their history, and we know that the Romans ruled by the trading of grain and bread. They were well off and did well as an empire, mostly by the grain that they had and the bread that they could eat. And so it's not surprising for us that Jesus would tell stories about bread to talk about what life he was giving to us. He said, hey, eat, I am the bread of life. But we know that he was born in the house of bread, Beth, house, Lehem, bread. In the house of bread, Jesus came to be without us. And remember at the beginning of his ministry, he had the temptations out in the wilderness. And one of those temptations from the devil was, turn these rocks into loaves of bread, just like God turned uh, and gave to the people manna in the desert. And so that temptation to end the famine, to give good life uh, to everyone through affluence was a temptation. But then there was a danger to it as well. That Jesus' life was not to be about the magic and about giving bread which would solve all the problems of the world. That he wasn't about simply ending hunger. That he was about something more. Not about the physical and changing everything where um, the people would like to have had that, you know, finally these uh, oppressed uh, uh, Jews would uh, be able to say, hey, we have this person who's able to provide all of this, we can rule the world. Well, that's not what Jesus was about. Milton, in his writing, Paradise Regained, said, thinkest thou such force in bread to bring lots of changes in life? And Dostoevsky, the Russian writer, said that this giving into this temptation would have lifted the world out of joint. What would happen if we had everything that we physically needed? And so Jesus came with that very special and important lesson. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. And so, many of you will remember that we were following, following on the story last week of the feeding of the 5,000. That there were two loaves and five fishes, whatever combination you have in the four gospel lessons. And 
the people came together, 5,000 or however many thousand there were that came together. And the people had enough because of what Jesus had done. That this was broken, distributed, and there were 12 baskets left over. And so it was an important message for the gospel people about how Jesus could provide all of the needs, but they weren't necessarily physical needs. They were the spiritual needs. There was a danger that people would misread this message that they had. And, and we hear that even today. And you know, some evangelists especially will talk about how if you pray enough, if you're faithful enough, if you're a really good Christian, you will become well off. You will have everything that you need. We know that's not the case. We have very faithful, very loyal people who have very difficult and challenging lives. And so Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. And what is it, is it that is important, that gives to us life and sustains us? We know that it is not just something spiritual, or something physical, but something that is spiritual, that holds us up. That because we have this gathering in this relationship with God, that we do have a life that can endure all the trials that we face. Jesus is the bread of life that sustains us spiritually. It's also a message about the bond that we have in the faith. And so the core story of our faith is the one of Jesus in the upper room. And uh, on that night before he was betrayed, he gathered with his loyal followers and he broke bread with them and shared how he was going to be broken as well. And it's a very special time that we reenact in our church as we have our communion services together. This is a time we want to remember that is very important to us. And we know it's a time when we bond with each other. We eat. A very important part of our service is when we go downstairs after church and have coffee and all of the, all of the things that are there. It's about us coming together and being able to share and talk. And, and I think our services would feel quite bald if we didn't have some kind of gathering afterwards where we shared in some coffee and in some bread. And so it's a recognition that as we eat together, that this is a spiritual thing that we do, that God draws us together. There's always some anxiousness about us being too public about our faith, especially in Canada. Uh, for those who travel through the States, you'll notice that in restaurants there are, are a lot more people who are sharing in grace before their meal in that restaurant than you find in Canada usually. It doesn't happen very often. And so there's something good and remarkable about that kind of public witness though, when um, someone's not afraid to simply uh, uh, quietly in a restaurant share some words of grace before their meal. Um, others aren't going to pay too much attention, but they might know this. I know of one fellow who knew of this anxiety that we have or our shyness, that uh, we don't want to make too much public show about our faith. And so before each meal, there would be this usual basket of rolls that comes to the table. And he would simply take a roll and pick it up and say, we come here together knowing that Jesus and gave us this food that Jesus draws us together and is here in this time that we share together. So it was not a big uh, pretentious thing, but just a way of being able to say, yes, this symbol, and in fact the symbol of the breaking of the bread, is probably enough for us to recognize that yes, this is a very special time that we have together. And we have uh, those readings of our daily bread, in which we recognize that Jesus really is the bread of life and gives to us all that we need. And so bread for us is a symbol. It's a wonderful symbol that we have, that we share within the faith, and that is really quite important to us because each time we see it, each time we break it, each time we share in it, we know that God is there. Let us bow in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for the kinds of messages that Jesus gives to us in these miracles and 
these acts that he performed in the gospel. We thank you for the lesson that we get today in which he talks about being the bread of life. And we ask that you be with us as we share in the bread together, that we will use it as a recognition of this faith that we share. We give thanks to you, O God. Amen. <coughs> Let's join together in number 650, 650, O God of Bethlehem.
make us hunger and thirst for the right, till our thirst for justice has been satisfied, and hunger has gone from the earth. Amen. church, that 
you would help us in our times in this country. Oh God, we live in a very secular world where sometimes we feel like the church is in a very uphill battle. Uh, that we aren't uh, loved the way we used to be. That we, uh, that many people think that we don't have much to say about this world and this life in which we live. Dear God, just help us to be able to be a church together. Bless us. Help the world to know that we have a very important message for everyone. A message of life. A message of hope. A message of renewal. A message about eternal things. Oh God, we bring our prayers to you and ask that you be with us as we raise up our prayers. Oh God, we take a few moments just in silence now to be with you and to be able to raise up to you those things that are important for us in the days ahead.
live joyously and hopefully today and every day. Amen. And go in peace.
Happy birthday. Thanks, Marty. I'm officially an old fart now. <laughs> How old are you? 65. 